my name is Maureen Glenn, and I'd like to tell you about this new podcast called Researching Practice, Introducing the Theory of Practice Architectures. With the originator of the theory of practice architectures, Stephen Chemis. So over the following 10 episodes, Stephen will guide you and me through the insights into his theory of practice architectures. My role in this podcast series is that of the curious explorer. And so let's introduce ourselves. So as I said, my name is Maureen Glenn, and I'm the co-convener of the Network for Educational Action Research in Ireland, NERI. I've worked all of my life to date as a teacher and as a school principal in Ireland. I'm also an independent consultant with teacher education and teacher professional development programs in Ireland. And my passion is educational action research, self-study and living educational theory research. So I think that sums me up. So now, Stephen, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I'm, uh, I'm joining us today from the central coast of New South Wales, a place called Gosford, about an hour's drive north of Sydney. And um, I suppose just in terms of my background, I, I studied um, as a, I was a student at the University of Sydney and, and did an arts degree in education. And then I traveled to Illinois, where I did a doctorate at the University of Illinois. Then I went to the UK, where I worked at the University of East Anglia, at a time when John Elliott and Lawrence Stenhouse were there. Uh, and then I came back to Australia and I worked at Deakin University for a while, or for a long while. Uh, and then I sort of left and became an independent consultant for a while. And then I went to Charles Sturt University, from which I retired uh, sometime later, something like 2013, I think. And I retired, but unfortunately, the money stopped coming in, but the work didn't. And so <laughs> I continue I continue writing and researching and working with other wonderful people around the world. And it's a fantastic opportunity to, to do it. And I've been I've been writing about mostly about research methods, uh, educational action research um, and in recent years for now more than a dozen years the theory of practice architecture is a way of understanding education and educational practice about which we will say more Maureen. Yes I'm looking forward to hearing all about this obviously I've read about it but it'll be lovely to hear your own um, insights into it. Um, would you like to tell us how you came to that? How did you come to your theory of practice architectures? How did it evolve for you? That's a, it's a very interesting question. I was sitting in an airport in um, in Leeds, Bradford, uh, and there was a delay for the planes. I was going from Norwich to Edinburgh, and um, I was sitting there thinking, what would I do if I could study practice the way I really wanted to? And I imagined studying people, I would put them in a, in a kind of perspex box and it would have marks, lines on a north, south, east, west in three dimensions. I'd videotape them in all directions. I'd be able to see what they did and how they did it and why they did it. And after five or 10 minutes of thinking about that, I knew that it was stupid and impossible people are practicing all the time in real life but one of the things that became really compelling for me at that time was trying to understand not just that people learned i was interested in studying uh, people learning in computer assisted learning experiments in um, the united kingdom all over the country at that time but how how the, the situations in which they worked were shaping what they did. And I had an image of a, I had an image one day as I was in a train going from London to Norwich and I passed this and there was a, a, a dinghy, a, a rowboat pulled up on a beach uh, beside a, 
uh, a, a lake is. And um, I thought, how do people learn to row? If you just got into the boat, it sort of would teach you if you sat on the chair and you looked in the direction you might expect towards the bow, you'd find you couldn't really reach the oars. But, and the oars only have one place to go, and that's in the rollocks. And if you want them to work, you've got to sit with your back to the bow. And you've got to get the oars so that they're biting in the water. So you have to have the, the conco face facing backwards. And then you have to pull on the oar. So the boat is actually built, designed to shape the way you can row in it. And that image had an incredible impact on me in terms of trying to work out how the material conditions and other conditions uh, of life that we live in shape what we can do. Uh, because up until that time, I was very, very uh, blinded by the idea that practice is people's intentional action. And it turns out to be what you can do under the circumstances. And how do you understand what the circumstances are? In the early 19, in the early 2000s, education in Australia and elsewhere, uh, educators were being told they had to improve what they did and they had to improve what they did. Uh, and be judged whether they were doing better than before, more testing of kids and monitoring of teachers and all the rest of it. And I became somewhat angry because governments were telling people to do more, but not giving them more, not giving them more help. In fact, they were taking help away. They were reducing the expenditure on professional learning, on uh, you, you know, support for teachers, uh, advice, consultants, all that sort of thing. If you want us to do a better job, give us the tools to do the job. And so the theory of practice architectures, one of the political reasons for the theory of practice architectures is to say, what sort of tools do we need to do the job? And so that's partly the genesis of the theory of practice architectures and we started writing and researching and doing ethnographies and so on. Yes, so it's it's quite a tangled web really, isn't it? As always. <laughs> the best kinds are always tangled. Okay, can I ask you what you think the most important aspect of your theory of practice architectures is for the ordinary worker, the ordinary Joe Soap? They are, um, are always practicing under conditions. There's a, there's a wonderful um, uh, quote from Marx. Men make history, but they do not make it um, just as they please. They make, us, make it under conditions already given from the past. And then the weight of all the dead rate all the dead traditions lies like a nightmare on the brains of the living. <laughs> you know, um, Stephen Dedalus in, um, in um, Ulysses, before he gets drunk and while he's still teaching in the classroom, is talking to kids about, about this question of how do people act and what do they do and how can they do it? And He's struck also by this uh, fact that we are constrained by what the situation is that we find ourselves in. He says something like this. He's talking about, um, he's talking with the kids about um, um, ancient history, and he knows that they think of it all as myths and stories, and it's not it's not it's not as if it were real you know and he's musing to himself and says something like did not Pyrrhus die at Ar Argos by a beldam's hand and was not Julius Caesar knifed to death they are not to be thought away time has fettered them and they are locked in the room 
of infinite possibilities they have ousted? Or was that possible, seeing that it never came to be? What was possible? What is possible under the circumstances in which we find ourselves? And so the theory of practice architectures is trying to make us more articulate about the circumstances that enable and constrain us, our thought, our language, the physical circumstances in which we find ourselves, the bodies in which we find ourselves with our own capacities and so on, and the social circumstances in which we find ourselves you know, intersectionally defined by race and class and gender and sexual orientation and so on and so forth. Um, we're always bearing the stamp of these circumstances. And so if the theory of practice architecture has helped us to understand what goes on in a classroom, not just as what the teacher did on the day and what the students did on the day, but what was possible? And was that other thing possible, seeing that it never came to be? <laughs> oh, yes, I can see we have an easy road ahead of us. <laughs> 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 um, that's great, Stephen. Thank you so much um, for giving us that overview. That's really great. OK, will we launch into it? So, Stephen, would you like to get started and just give us a little introductory taste of, of, of what these episodes are going to contain. Will do. Oops. There we go. So there we are. So there we are, Maureen. Great. Now, <clears throat> the first question that I'm trying to answer in this series is why talk about practice? And partly that's because there's been a a big change in social theory towards understanding practice as, as opposed to individual action or human behavior. We'll say more about that. And why a theory of practice architectures to understand how and why everyday and professional practices happen as they do. So how am I going to approach this task with you, Maureen? Well, first, this introduction, then I want to talk about the ways in which practices are more than just our individual action. I want to talk about their extra individual, or we might say communal features. They're not just what people do, but they're shaped by the situations around them. The language people use, the, the material circumstances in which they find themselves relationships of power and solidarity, care, love, friendship with people around them. And so we're gonna try and find out some of that about practices. But another way of describing what practices are is to talk about them in terms of different traditions for the study of practices. And the way researchers have studied practices make a huge difference in what they discover about them. It's a bit like the blind men and the elephant. You know, somebody finds the trunk, somebody finds a leg, somebody finds a tail, etc. But how you how you see practices really shapes the way you can understand them. And some of the ways that we understand them are pretty self-limiting. They prevent us from understanding practices in a richer way. Uh, this is very important. It sounds fantastically boring. People, I'm sure it will be. <laughs> people meet one another in everyday life in three dimensions, I argue. We meet one another in the dimension of semantic space in language, thinking, talking, writing, reading. We meet one another under material conditions, even like these on Zoom and, and so on. And we meet one another in social relationships that are always already 
shaped before we arrive in them. One of the lovely things about this uh, um, series, Maureen, is that while we have sort of worked together before, we've never worked closely together before. And so there's a genuine conversation between us of trying to understand one another. But we meet one another in a social space in which you're you and I'm me, and both of us have all of the usual entanglements of everyday life around us, and they shape how these things will unfold. Then uh, we're now up to the main meal, the theory of practice architectures. Why? Because we want to understand practices and we want to be able to transform them. And I think it's very difficult to, to get this grasp, but I'm hoping that the kind of ways that I'll talk about the theory of practice architectures will give us a sense of how practices are enabled and constrained, how they're made possible, how they're sustained by the ways they happen in those three dimensions of intersubjective space, language, work and power, as you want, we might want to call them. Then I want to talk briefly about the fact that practices are distributed. Am I talking and you're talking and this is two practices? Or are we interacting and it's one practice that involves different participants? I think many practices are distributed and they require multiple players to participate in them. And if you um, <coughs> happen to be watching um, uh, a football game, it's not only the players on the field and the umpires and the um, <clears throat> spectators, it's the people who make the studs that go on the football boots and the laces and the people who paint the uh, lines on the ground. There are many, many people who are involved in the distributed practice of football, not just the players. But pl practices are more complicated in another way. They connect up with one another uh, in ecologies of practices. So teaching practices are influenced by professional learning practices. Learning practices are influenced by teaching practices. Uh, and there are multiple other kinds of practices that are interacting in ecologies of practices. And it's not always clear when practices are actually interdependent with one another. But this idea of ecologies of practices um, emboldens me to think that a practice, riding a bike, uh, performing a surgery, giving a talk, all of these practices are like species. They have a character of their own, they come into being, they exist, they grow, they develop, they change. Uh, they may evolve into other practices, but they're connected up with other practices that are in the ecosystem around them. And so practices are like species in being dependent on niches where they are supported and sustained. This practice can work in this place, but not in that place. Um, but they also work in relation to other practices going on around them. And so trying to understand the way that practices are as species, if you like, are being uh, enabled and constrained by other practices nearby uh, is an interesting question for me. Then finally, what does this tell us about changing practices? And here, I want to talk a little bit about the role of learning uh, because we think that we can change practices by uh, people learning to practice differently, but it's more complicated than that. So then I move on to action research and the theory of practice architectures. 
to say that if we want to change our practices, uh, if we want to change our practices, we need to change how we understand our practices, what we do in our practices, and the conditions under which we practice. And so action research is a way of making us aware and alert and sensitive to all of those things and how we are changing with others in the circumstances where we practice. Then sort of the, um, for me, a major um, point of all of this. I'm interested in the practice of education and I'm interested in education as a, as a process that helps people to live well in worlds worth living in. And I think that's why educators turn up to work every day to help people to live well in worlds worth living in. It's a double purpose of education. But the institution of schooling doesn't always make those things easy. The institution of schooling sometimes blocks those educational practices, threatens them, makes them vulnerable, uh, makes it harder to do the work of education, even though schools have been going for at least two millennia, two and a half. And, um, and that's only in the West. Uh, and they've been designed to nurture education. But as Oscar Wilde said, each man kills the thing he loves. Sometimes educators also kill education by overdoing the apparatus of schooling in ways that make it harder, not easier for people to learn. And then coming to some conclusion, who knows what those will be, Maureen? But we'll arrive I guess we'll somehow. wait and see. Time will tell. Indeed. Okay, that's great, Stephen. Thank you for giving us that overview um, of, of what, what is ahead of us in these um, episodes. So I, I think you've given us a flavour of, of what is ahead of us and what the next episodes um, entail. I look forward to, to hearing the story unfold as we go ahead. So the next episode is episode two and is entitled Practices Are More Than Individual Action. They have extra individual features. So in that episode, Stephen will analyse what we mean by the term practice and indeed what the role of practice in the theory of practice architectures is. So looking forward to meeting you at our next episode. Um, so it's goodbye for now from me. And from me, and thank you for having us.